Hey everybody, today it's another episode of Music Therapy with me, Brian Kroc. I'm doing an Anthony Fantano kind of a thing, and I've got even better teeth. <laughs> All right, here we go. In this show, I'm answering viewer questions and just trying to give my honest opinion about all things music, art, life, whatever. All right, hello, my name is Joe asks, what to do when everything you make starts sounding the same? blow up your creative process. Do, do it completely differently. If you focus on being creative in the actual process of writing and less on the final product of what you're making, so in other words, relinquish your control over the final product, you'll be surprised by what you can come up with. Um, so yeah, focus on the process. If what you normally do is write at the piano, shut the piano lid and write away from the piano, write on the guitar or just sit at your desk and write. If what you normally do is write on a DAW, um, maybe you write in the piano roll, uh, don't do that. Write with samples, sing into your phone. There's really just an infinite number of ways that you can create stuff. Um, so I would say change your process. Benjamin Malone asks, are there harmonic and compositional realms to still be created? Is there a point to trying my own thing to build a complete style from the ground up? Without a doubt, yes to the first question. Uh, music is infinite. There's no doubt in my mind that there's gonna be new uh, exciting discoveries year after year until human beings cease to exist. But the second and third corollaries to this question sort of fall off the true path after that. Um, to me, you're more likely to stumble onto your own thing if you focus on studying history, learning from the real masters of the music, um, and don't really focus on innovating. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but I think it's true. You're always gonna sound like you, no matter what you do. Look at, for example, saxophonist Steve Coleman. I think it's incontestable at this point that he created his own unique musical universe, um, but he didn't build it from the ground up. What he did first was he studied the great jazz masters, played with them, learned from them, and then he started to take sabbaticals around the world where he would study music of other cultures. I think, you know, now with some of his more recent records, he's studying like physiognomy and how the human body works. And, you know, I think that for the most part, you're going to find something new by studying something that already exists. You're not just going to make it up out of thin air. And, you know, there are so many similar figures. Anthony Braxton is very similar. I got a perfect idea for five cents. You got to name this one. <laughs> I'm tired of memorizing all this stuff and not getting the chance to check it. You gotta, you gotta memorize. You gotta tell me which one this is. He obviously studied his stuff. Um, I also just want to say, in no way am I really qualified to answer this question. Uh, I'm still in the process of learning. I, I'm just doing it publicly in the form of these videos. Tim Russell asks, how do you analyze electronic music? Uh, this is another great question that I'm not at all qualified to answer because I've never analyzed electronic music, but I'll try. All right, so the term electronic music is an incredibly broad umbrella because the vast majority of music in 2021 is created in the box. Uh, with laptop computers or whatever. Uh, so electronic music is pop music. It's um, the most avant-garde classical music. It's electronica, it's dance music. It's weird mixtures of those worlds like Autoker. I think what the person is, is asking about really are artists like Venetian Snares, Autoker, um, one that I particularly love, Wolf Parkinson White, people who make like electronic art music. This is like a brilliant corner of the musical world that I love. 
but I've only dipped my toes into it. I've messed around with Max MSP, Renoise, Nodal, um, Reactor. And, you know, I do like to design my own synth sounds in, you know, like the native instruments, VSTs, Absinthe. I really love Absinthe, FM8. I've dipped my toes into that world and you can hear examples of my electronic music in the underscoring to some of my videos, but there's a reason it's underscoring and it's not available elsewhere. I don't think that I'm particularly good at this because it's not what I've spent the majority of my time doing. But this question begs another question, which is why do you want to analyze electronic music? I think this sort of piggybacks off the last question. Electronic music is a art form that is very much about the process. People spend, you know, dozens of hours dialing in a perfect sound with their, you know, wall full of modular synth equipment or, um, you know, create environments inside Max MSP these types of things that will never be replicable again. And then they just print it, they record it. And, and what you're listening to is an instantiation, instantiation of that process. So it's not really about the final product so much. If I were gonna analyze this music, I would first wanna know what environment were they writing the music in? And if it was say a wall of modular synth equipment, then I would want to learn as much as I can about those effects and how they're chained together and what they specifically do, you know, and then I would try to implement those things in my own writing. Because I think the goal of analysis isn't analysis in and of itself. It's so that you can incorporate something that resonates with you into your own work. Actually, quick shout out to a new blog called Mix Perspective, where this guy named Ben Davey, I think that's his name, Ben Davey analyzes the soundscapes of like really great pop music. And uh, I read a lot of his posts while I was working on the Phoebe Bridgers video because he gives you very clear explanations of like what kind of plugins or outboard gear the producers might have been using and even sort of recreates sounds and tries to figure out exactly the settings of the gear and things like that. Talks about the panning and the reverb and the compression and how it all works together to tell the story of the song. It's super fascinating. I've been learning a lot from that. All right. Okay, Pablo Millas Pajes asks, have you experimented with Ethan Iverson's fast metronome and slow metronome games? Would you maybe recommend other similar games? So I checked out this blog post. I actually hadn't seen this blog post before, even though I'm a huge Ethan Iverson fan. Yeah, so I've done the slow metronome thing quite a bit. This is a really common way to use a metronome. You basically want to think of the metronome more as something that's keeping you honest, but not as something that's dictating the beat, because the fact of the matter is the great jazz music isn't perfectly in time. The goal isn't perfect time. Perfect time would sound wrong. I actually saw Jeff Ballard in a masterclass say, point blank, don't ever use a metronome. And there's lots of drummers who will give you advice like that. Um, I'm less extreme, but then again, my time isn't nearly as great. Metronomes can be great as a way to sort of keep track of your progress. If you're trying to improve your chops, you know, you can say, I can play this at 68 beats per minute and shoot for 74 and slowly bump it up. But in terms of other games that I've done with a metronome, some of the hardest stuff to do is to just play like all quarter notes, all half notes through a, through a tune with the metronome, say always on beat three, and then work your way up to being able to play through a whole form of a tune with just eighth notes, and then with quarter note triplets, and then with eighth note triplets, and then with 16th notes. Then you try and mix up those different durations so that you have this sort of like elastic feeling time. So you're using some eighth notes, some 16th notes, some triplets, whatever. Why don't I give it a try while we're here and I have my bass clarinet right in front of me and you guys can all just see me fall on my ass. It'll be cool. Sorry, I haven't warmed up or anything. Let me do that real quick. Leo Pellegrino taught me this trick to get your reed uh, unwarped. <laughs> Two. And you get the 
idea. Let's see. Let me try the fast metronome thing. I've never tried that. That sounds hard. <laughs> God, that's so hard, holy shit. Uh... It's clear that I need to practice that shit. Wow. Okay, this next question from Paul M is quite long, but I, the gist, of the question is, how much do people really practice? Paul is saying that he's heard various figures claim to practice, uh, you know, an inhuman amount of time. And he quotes John Zorn saying that he used to practice 15 hours a day. And he quotes Rick Beato claiming that he practiced 10,000 hours in the span of six months. Now, here's the thing. I, I, I think we should give these people the benefit of the doubt Musicians do tend to exaggerate how much they practice because when you practice, you get into a flow state and you really lose track of time. I don't think they're intentionally making this up, but you do hear musicians exaggerate quite a lot. I once went to a one-off lesson where this gentleman suggested to me that I practice, that I create a routine where I practice flute for two hours in the morning, and then clarinet for two hours, and then saxophone for two hours, and then oboe for two hours, and that I do that every day. That's ludicrous, of course. Um, we all have to work to make a living. We all have obligations. So it's impossible to practice that many hours every single day. When you're in high school and when you're in college, even though you think you're busy, you're not. So practice as many hours as you can when you're a kid and you don't have responsibilities. But once you become an adult, your time becomes limited. I remember hearing Chris Potter say one time that uh, he is lucky if he has half an hour to practice in a day. I'm sure this has changed during the pandemic where we have lots more time. But when things were normal, Chris Potter would get his practicing in during sound checks and that's about it. And I can relate to that. When you're on the road, you travel for like whatever, eight hours in a day you're exhausted when you get to the hotel, you crash for a couple hours, you go to the theater or the venue or whatever, you get a few minutes to warm up, you play into your microphone to make sure it's working and everything sounds good, and you're left with very little time. So what you have to do is be really organized and smart about how you're gonna use your time. So basically just look at your schedule for a particular day and say to yourself, I have 20 minutes to practice today. How can I use that 20 minutes? Make sure your practice is focused, that you're not playing for five minutes and then checking out your phone for five minutes. So the answer to your question, Paul, is yeah, people don't practice for 15 hours a day. Conrad Herman asks, what are your thoughts on overcomplicated music? And he cites Brian Farnyhoe and uh, Jacob Collier. So I enjoy complexity for complexity's sake. Maybe I'm in the minority there, but Brian Farnyho, Elliot Carter, Helmut Lachenmann, um, Beat Fuhrer, uh, etc. Give me more of that. I love that stuff. Trying to play that music is an absolute trip, and the musicians who specialize in doing it are gods in my book. But I think the heart of your question comes down to the artist's motivation. If the motivation is, uh, I want to explore something, try to try out a new sound that I've never heard before, I'm all for that. It's an experiment. It doesn't have to sound great. Sometimes it might, sometimes it might not. I support that. If the point of the complexity is more of a sort of like, look at how talented I am. Aren't I special? I'm, I'm so chilling. Uh, that to me is egotistical, egoistic, egotistical, egoistic. I don't know which word to use. It immediately turns me off. It's, it's not a good vibe. Um, you know, the, there's this cruel irony that people who try too hard to be liked are so unlikable right? It's the same thing in music. Music that's trying too hard to impress, it's not impressive. Being yourself 
is generally what attracts people. Robert F. Bloomshine, my dude Bob, asks, um, any metal album recommendations? Yeah, so what I decided to do with this question is to, to give people from different worlds an eye into the metal scene. Um, I, I've gotten a lot of questions this time around about metal because it seems to be something that I share in common with a lot of the viewers of this show. Um, but I'm gonna save those questions for later because in the next couple months, hopefully I'm gonna be sitting down with an expert on metal, a metal god in his own right. And so I wanna save these questions for his perspective. So here's what I'll say. If you're coming from the classical music world, a great way in to metal is the band Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum. If you're coming from the jazz world, a great way in would be like the Canterbury scene or uh, classic progressive rock like King Crimson or Yes, that type of stuff. My first metal CDs were King's X, Gretchen Goes to Nebraska, um, Blizzard of Oz by Ozzy Osbourne, and Far Beyond Driven by Pantera. My cool uncle, Bob, bought me those when I was a kid. Those are all classics. Those are all stone cold classics. Those are like, you know, those are the the like bird dial recordings uh, for metal. So you can't go wrong with any of those. And then if you're looking for like metal recommendations for like currently, um, I've been digging the new Mr. Bungle album, which is a recreation of their first demo recording called The Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny. Um, and it's their most metal recording ever by far. And then also the new Napalm Death record is really good. It's called Throws of Joy in the Jaws of Defeatism. I mean, and then just the classics, Metallica, Megadeth, you can't go wrong with those. Um, well, you can go wrong with those, sorry. Uh, early Megadeth and Metallica. Okay, and then I'm gonna answer one more from Conrad Herman because he's a Patreon dude. Conrad also asked favorite Shostakovich symphony. I don't know too much about Shostakovich, to be honest. I really like his piano music. Um, the, the preludes and fugues that he wrote. I really like his um, cello concertos, uh, and I know those pretty well. But the symphonies, I've, I've heard them, but I've never really studied them. I think that the 15th symphony is closest to my heart because I remember going to see the Chicago Symphony Orchestra play that when I was just a kid, and my parents let my brother and I take the train into downtown Chicago and, and go to the symphony and we just had such a blast. I remember sitting in the audience and thinking to myself, I have no idea what is going on, how any of this is being done. It just didn't make any sense to me and it, that excited me so much and kind of put me on this path. So I'm gonna say the 15th. Where's Mr. Bailey asks, uh, ever have a professor water down or force you to change composition or arranging choices? Yes, that happened to me all the time, and they were always right uh, every single time. So, uh, there's that. Sam O'Brien asks me, what's one of your favorite gigs you've went to? Off the top of my head, the album release concert for Anna Weber's record Clockwise, I think that was in 2018. That was like a life-affirming experience for me. Even further back, my high school buddies and I traveled from Chicago to Atlanta in 2006, maybe, and uh, we were we were just but youths, and we went to Prague Power, USA. I think it was Volume Seven. There we saw Freak Kitchen, we saw Evergrey, um, Epica. Who else played? There were so many great progressive and power metal bands from Europe who never really get to come to the US that often. I'll never forget that. I, I specifically remember looking out in the audience and seeing the band members of Evergrey because they were all like a head and a shoulder taller than everybody else because they're like Nordic gods. Um, I wonder if there's still a band. I haven't really been following them. Um, okay, since I have it right here, um, Jerombo asks, what bass clarinet do you use? I use an absolute piece of shit garbage Bundy bass clarinet that I bought for $800. 
Bass clarinets are like Rolls Royces. They're, they're an expensive luxury. They easily cost tens of thousands of dollars. I'll probably never have a good one. It doesn't matter. Um, as long as it, you know, as long as it works, you can make it sound good. Uh, I, I think it's important not to become a gear nerd. That being said, if I ever got a gig like a Broadway show or, or something that required bass clarinet, at that point I would probably invest in a professional instrument, but I, I don't have the funds and I can't justify it. I think about it all the time. <laughs> Samoa Barcia asks, how do you balance your time between composing and practicing? Um, poorly. I'm going to leave you for this question with advice I got from Dave Liebman, the great saxophone player. He just said, at, at some, some point, point, you just got to put the horn down. down. And I think that's good advice. So you can practice forever and ever, but if you want to write music, you got to put the horn down. I tend to prioritize writing. I don't do a good job of balancing it. I don't think anybody really can. It's it's so hard. Edvard's Kajva, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, buddy, um, asked, can you name one non-musician who's been a great inspiration slash idol to you? I have a ton. Recently, I would say that the work ethic and the artistry of um, the great golfer Dustin Johnson has been super inspiring to me. I also just became aware of Michelle McNamara and I'm inspired not just by her great writing, but also by her personality, how her specific skill set of putting people at ease and being a good listener um, enabled her to achieve things in her field that nobody else could do. But the greatest inspiration for me has always been uh, James Joyce, ever since a friend of mine introduced me to The Dead from Dubliners, uh, maybe, I don't know, a long time ago now. Very, very inspiring James Joyce. All right, so that's it for this episode of Music Therapy with me, Brian Kroc. If you want to get in on these, um, just follow me on Instagram or Twitter or here on YouTube. I will always let you know when one's coming around the corner. I'm trying to do these like once a month. And... If you really want to make sure your question gets answered, join my Patreon at any tier because I will always answer those people. So thank you. And uh, now I'm going to play some more bass clarinet, I guess.